Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Whiskey Talk. I'm Josh. And I'm Christine. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, whether or not life exists outside of Earth. Do you think there is intelligent life outside of our solar system? And today we are drinking the Dubliner Irish whiskey. It's bourbon cask aged. Um, bourbon so, cask aged. Yeah, so I, right. I picked it up because I know, Christine, that you really enjoy Irish whiskey, and I'm trying to get you to like bourbon, so I thought it might, you know, we might find some of the flavors in bourbon in this Irish whiskey, and it might, you know, convert you. Don't a lot of uh, whiskeys come from bourbon barrels, though? Wasn't that something... That's correct. Are they just kind of stating the obvious then? Well, um, so they they use non-virgin barrels from all over the place, not necessarily uh, bourbon. Sometimes okay. yes, sometimes no. Okay, you know, so it was the majority of them were bourbon. For sure. Um, but there is a bunch of other barrels that are used in aging Irish whiskey, scotches, and all that stuff. Sherry, um, different wine barrels sometimes. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I love sherry cask. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but e- I mean, even in like blended whiskeys like Jameson, they use, uh, you know, they use some sherry barrels and some wine barrels and some bourbon barrels, you know, so it's not exclusively bourbon barrels. Now, this specifically says on it, it's the aging of the fine old bourbon casks that gives the Dubliner Irish whiskey its special warmth and sweet honeyed finish. Okay. Um, so yeah, sweet honeyed finish. Yeah. So it's a nice honey color when you look at it in the bottle. Yeah, for sure. It's very, very uh, bright. Reminds you of a honeybee. Hmm. <laughs> oh, honeybee. Yeah. All right. It's, well, hold on. Let me. Uh, you want to nose it first? Sm- it definitely smells sweet. No. Yeah. It smells a little harsh. I don't know. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it is assaulting my nose a little bit. Like an oh. Irish grandpa. What's the alcohol content on this? Let's it's, see. it's probably eighty proof. Most Irish biscuits yeah, around 80. Yeah, 40% 80. alcohol. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, cheers. Salancha. Mmm. Um, mmm. <laughs> you, oh, your face right now. What have you done to me? <laughs> what? what do you mean, what have I done to you? Remember okay. that time I talked about alcohol face? Yeah, you just made alcohol face? Yeah, this is not... Maybe it was just a bad first impression, Dubliner. Maybe maybe we got <laughs> off on the wrong foot. Maybe. All right, hold on. Uh, yeah, there's no getting around it. This is kind of, this is not, this is not enjoyable. <laughs> it's weird because at first, when it first hits the tongue, it, it is sweet and it's, it is pleasant. And, but then it burns. Then it's, then it, then it like punches you. It's like, it's like. <laughs> it's like those Sour Patch Kids commercials where, like, first they're sweet and then they're sour. <laughs> or they're sour and then they're sweet. But this one, it's definitely like. It's like, oh, oh it's I'm, like, oh, this is nice. And then it, like, turns around and, like, gives you a hook to the face. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a, some harshness in the finish of this whiskey for sure. Um, um, yeah, I think I can handle drinking this neat, um, but I, I wouldn't. I, I might want to just put it in ginger ale. I don't know how you feel. <laughs> um, I think I'll do one neat out of respect because this is their very first batch. Um, so maybe it's only going to get better. I don't know. I want to I wanna try. I'm going to try and finish a glass. I want to I wanna, I wanna try. Give it the old try. Yeah, here we go. Oh, man. You're, you're, uh, dude, I, I wish I could get... I'm going to try and get some snapshots of your face while drinking this whiskey. <laughs> this is really enjoyable. I'm glad that you're entertained. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're amused. I'm I'm happy that something pleasurable is arising out of this situation. Because <laughs> it's, it's not pleasant on your tongue. And Josh never picked the whiskey again. <laughs> BS, BS. <laughs> this is an interesting whiskey, even if it's not the best. You know, it's... um. I mean, it's their very you know first what? batch. I've had things that I've liked less. It's still... I like this better than Laphroaig. Okay. I've heard somebody say Laphroaig tastes like old Band-Aids. I don't... Um, I mean, if you like PD scotch, then Laphroaig is great. Mm-hmm. I don't like PD scotch. Okay. Um. So that's kind of... And, and I know people that love Laphroaig, like, like passionately adore Laphroaig. And yeah. that's their you know special treat and their go-to... But Laphroaig, Laphroaig is interesting because it's it's a really really intense scotch. It's one of the most intense ones out there, I think, uh, in my experience behind the bar. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of scotch heads out there that are screaming at their computers right now about all the ones that are more intense. Uh, there's another one called the Peat Monster, um, which you should never try. <laughs> yeah, it sounds 
That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> Monster is probably aptly named. Yeah. So if you don't like people, so. but I but I love to introduce. I, I love to have um like for example when I talk to like new waitresses or new bar staff about scotch, I will often pour a glass of Lafroy for them because it really emphasizes how intense uh, the spirit can be. Like as the first thing you give them? No, no, no. I mean, just as an example, as, oh, okay. as a good example of a scotch and how and how bold it can be. Uh, and, and I'll pour them like a blended scotch, like something very, very middle of the road, like J and B or Dewars. Oh, okay. Or yeah. Dewars, and then I'll say, okay, and then here's something called Lafroy, which is really, really intense. Okay. And this is the variation you can find in scotch. Because I definitely would never pick Lafroy as an example of scotch, like of what <laughs> scotch is, like to embody like as a whole. Well, certainly not. But, yeah. But so at to, first I was like, "You're mean. Well, like, that's well, horrible." <laughs> but just because you don't like it, you know. But but just to just to emphasize how again, like how strong and how bold it can be, and how how varied it can be. Um, <laughs> you're you're staring down that glass like it's like it's about to cha- it's challenging you to boxing. In a way, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Irish boxing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta set my jaw and take my medicine. You know? Oh man! Um, so I've learned. We have learned a, a good deal. Um, now this is, uh, I think, our fifth episode now. And um, in our first episode, we did sort of a crash course in uh, whiskey, and it was a crash course for ourselves as well, because um, we've been learning a lot of things that we don't know um, so far on our journey, and we're certainly not experts. You learned a whole bunch about charring, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, which is, you know, fire, <laughs> lighting things on fire. It's all within my realm of interest and yeah. uh, like your I tongue, like to think expertise. Like your tongue right now with this uh, mediocre Irish whiskey. Well, you know. Is it getting better as you drink it? Um, I don't think I've seen you take a sip. I've mostly been swishing it around the glass and looking at it. <laughs> 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 we're having We're having a little bit of a, like, Wild West stare down, me and this whiskey. <laughs> Yeah, talk talk about charring. Focus. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> it's pretty interesting because, as some of you may know, there are different levels of char, but it's not the char itself that uh, impacts the flavor. It's it's the way that the char and lighting the wood on fire changes the chemical compound of the wood. So, depending on different levels of being burnt the chemical compound is different and you're releasing different flavors. So oh, I see. yeah, for instance, there's a compound called a uh, hemicellulose. That's right. Just remembered that off the top of my head. <laughs> and that is like a type of sugar in the wood. So when you char that, that caramelizes. And that's how you get the caramel flavor ah, in the whiskey. Super cool. Yeah. Uh, so there's another one called lignin, which is where your uh, vanillin flavor and the spice comes from. Mm. So, but these all have different, they're all activated at different temperatures. Okay. So they, the characteristics of them come through the more or less the wood is charred. Uh, also, uh, what's interesting is that, as you know, Carbon is a great filtration. You know, when you when you build a filter like for water, mm-hmm. you know you have carbon in there. Uh, so when you have that in your whiskey barrel, it's filtering the negative your whiskey, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, it's filtering all the negative byproducts and all the things you don't want, the flavor agents you don't want in your whiskey. Right. So if your water is has like sulfur content in it, mm-hmm. that's going to be taken out through the char. Oh, super cool. And so there are like five levels of charring. Uh, Fourth is uh, usually the most popular. And what's interesting is that uh, they call it the alligator char. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, Because the inside of the barrel, once it's charred to that degree, it breaks up into that pattern that looks like alligator scales. Yeah. And yeah, I've seen that in campfires. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you've seen that in the in the wood on a campfire. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's cool about that is those fissures in the char uh, allow the the whiskey to like pass through to the oak on the other side. Mm. So it gets the oak and it gets the char. Right. So it goes it goes through there. It's getting like filtered a little bit more and it just the way that it affects the 
you know, the whiskey getting in contact with all of those different characteristics and like chemical compounds. It's really fascinating. Oh, very so, cool. Yeah, I really learning. enjoyed learning about uh, charred barrels. It was super, super fascinating. Yeah. So I would love to, I'll probably write some of that up and put yeah, that absolutely. on the, yeah. hashtag, on the blog. Hashtag learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love this. You know, this is really, I feel like this is what we set out to do is we're, we're learning more ourselves and then we're able to pass that knowledge on to our listeners. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm just totally I love learning things, mm -hmm. so I'm just totally jazzed up. Yeah, and folks will say you know like real wh whiskey takes that uncovering of the knowledge because then you can start to really fully understand it, um, and understand what's happening on your tongue as well as you drink it. I know what's happening on my tongue right now is the spirit's not aged enough. Yeah, specifically. <laughs> um, I still haven't had another. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, you're making that face again. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go get some soda. I'm gonna get some ice. I'm gonna get some soda, and we're gonna put this in ginger ale. Oh, oh you looked. You looked almost like you wanted to spit on me. Ugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. My eyes are watering. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird because I I I hate like it. Like there are there are characteristics of this whiskey that I. <laughs> Oh my God, he's dying. <laughs> I've slain him with my face. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are characteristics of this that I like. Mm. It's it's weird because it has potential. I hate it, but I like it. But I hate it. But hmm. there are like there. So are you gonna give it a wiggly <sighs> thumb? No, it's getting a thumbs down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there are like little characteristics in it that I want to like take out and be like. Use these and make them more. Hmm. You know, I, I wonder if like specifically it's half and half things you like, things you hate because it's literally Irish whiskey and bourbon, bourbon cascaged. Yeah, that's really funny. It yeah. might literally be just the just marriage something, of something, something you love and something you hate. You know, <sighs> but it's okay. I mean, I mean, we're discovering that this is a really ingrained flavor profile that you don't enjoy. Maybe. Um, I would love, I would love, love, love. I'd still want to give you a really high aged, really finely done bourbon. Well, um, after doing the reading, uh, I am wondering if I like malted barley. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, and it makes me want to go back and, you know, research the whiskeys that I know that I like mm -hmm. uh, and see if that's what's going on, you know? Well, I, I certainly know that most sc scotch is required to be from malted barley. Okay. Yeah, that's that's one of the okay, definite well, I do things in their definition. Like scotch. Yeah. So now you know you get into much deeper definitions when you talk about blended whiskey versus single malt and all of that stuff. You know, you know another fun fun fact I learned: uh, Johnny Walker Black Label. You know, it's in a square bottle. Yeah. A lot of those Johnny Walker products are in square bottles. That was originally so uh, the company could fit more bottles into a case to ship it, so oh. it cost them less to ship. Well, thrifty. Well yeah. done, Johnny Walker. Yeah, very, very smart. John, this one's for you. Uh, do you want... Uh, I'll go get you some... I feel like you'd be insulted that we're <laughs> toasting him with this. I, I would be. If anybody toasts okay. me with this, I... All right, I... that's it. That's it. Pause it. I'm going to get some ginger ale. Okay, thank you. Sad. That's one of the other cool things about doing this podcast. We're, we're getting quite a, a neat... Police car, you're not part of this podcast. Police car disagrees. Cheers, by the way. I hope you enjoy this much more than the, uh... Three cheers. The, the elite Dubliner. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> yep. As our whiskey collection grows, I have a feeling that uh, Dubliner is going to get some dust on the bottle. It mixed well. Yeah, I'll there give you it go. that. You know, it, you know. It, it might just be more of a mixing whiskey. Yeah, so. that's okay. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've, we've learned a lot since episode one already, and this is only maybe episode five. Um, so it's, it's been really cool. Um, and thank you to everyone for helping point out all the inaccuracies and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, we're not, we're not perfect. Um, yeah. And we're know, still learning a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like us learning was part of the goal to begin with, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I look forward to a time in the future where we look back on, uh, these opening episodes and think about what whiskey babies we were <laughs> and how much wiser we are now yeah it's been it's there's a lot of opinions flying you know it's it's been fun it's been cool 
Yeah, like with anything that is important to uh, <laughs> a, a community of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Dissenting opinions and um, whatnot. So shall Speaking we, of which. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> shall we move on and talk about that aliens? That was a beautiful segue. <laughs> yeah, segue. It's a very strange vehicle. I don't recommend you ride one. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, whether or not life exists outside of Earth. Do you think there is intelligent life outside of our solar system? Uh, I do. The universe is so large that we really cannot fathom how large it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I I feel like out of all the stars and all the planets and all the all the stuff that we don't even know is out there that we haven't even touched the edges, you know, of whatever else may be there. The likelihood that it's just us is... I feel like that's incredibly unlikely. Yeah, and science agrees um, just because of sheer probability from the number of stars we know exist. Um, There's a really famous uh, example, and I'll have to look up the exact um, uh, stuff so you guys can check it out, Um, but they they put it to this black spot in space and they said, oh, I wonder if there's anything out there, and they like took a photo and there was just just billion, just an unfathomable amount of stuff out there. Just galaxies and stars and planets and, and all of that stuff was just, just filled yeah. the entire screen of which they thought there was nothing. And that was the moment in history where we really realized, like astrophysicists really realized how vast the universe was and how tiny and tiny and minuscule we are in, in the vast expanse of the cosmos. Yeah. Um, so mathematically speaking, when it comes to um, life elsewhere it pretty much has to exist, right? Yeah, not to mention that, like, things like black holes. We don't even know what's on the other side of that. Like, what, mm. what's going on? See, I, hmm. like it's... I, I have a lot of theories about these things, and, uh, and they're not exactly based in science, but they're based in how I feel, which is sort of like BS, right? <laughs> but, like... I wouldn't say that, but... But, like, like black holes, we always talk about how <laughs> we don't really know what happens because we can't see past it. Right. So I feel like everyone just goes crazy with that idea. It's like, well, we can't see past a, a black hole, so we don't know like what's on the other side. So it could be anything. It could be a whole other universe in there. But no, we know that gravity is so hard that everything's just crushed together. So yeah, it's, it's basically just... like the garbage disposals of the universe. Right. So it's probably just crushed matter. Like, why do we think that it's a whole other universe in there? It's just crushed shit like <laughs> yeah but we are all made of star stuff like we are all oh, made of you're crushed there? shit well okay like so all those particles <sighs> could come back together on the other side that's not exactly like oh man that, that's not exactly like what people think when it comes to black holes at least what my impression is that scientists think they The idea is that the matter gets crushed so far down that, like, it... (sighs) That it's not even building blocks anymore? Well, I'm trying to think of the original Carl Sagan's Cosmos where he talks about... He talks about the origin of the cosmos, and he talks about how, like, like cosmologists have to ask all the big questions. Like, if... (laughs) Like, this thing that's around us, this universe, it exists. How did it get here? Was it always here? Did somebody put it here? Like, and what he ends up building to is a black hole the ways in which physics works don't necessarily, they can't necessarily work in, the, in in a black hole because science can't explain how all of those things can possibly be in that one minuscule space. So the only way to explain it is that it creates a, some sort of other space or some sort of gate to another universe. Yeah, and so what much... if there's a black hole in that one? Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, what <laughs> if it just all... Right, so there's one moment where he looks around him and he says, if you want to know what's in a black hole, perhaps just look around you. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought, too. (laughs) Oh, man, Carl Sagan, we are just... (laughs) I've told you a million times we have to watch Cosmos. Yeah, well, I've watched the newer one with Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I've never seen the older one. You've got to watch the old one. one, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson's awesome, and his stuff's very, like, um, it's very exciting because they use all the technology that's available to us now to make it flashy and fun. But Sagan only had his own, like, beautiful language to do it so he spends a lot of time using eloquent language to describe science and just mediocre like 80s graphics and stuff which makes it even more endearing because you can you can see on his face how much he loves it oh that's awesome <laughs> you know i don't know if anybody's still still with us out there after that black hole discussion it's been a very in-depth uh, episode <laughs> and honestly like i'm sure there again when i talk about whiskey i'm sure there are plenty of whiskey heads out there screaming at their computers about what i'm saying and 
figured and out. And scientists. Out there are right. scientists also screaming right. at their And there are plenty of... There are or pl- in their cars. You know, you thought you had a stressful day at work, but here you are now listening Let, to listen us. Listen to some a-hole bartender <laughs> try and talk about black holes. Um, oh, science. Um, but, so we've, we veered off talking about black holes because it, just the sheer mass of things we don't know about the universe. You know, but but I started talking about black holes again because like people love this idea. People love this idea that we could look around us and we're in a black hole and we don't know what's on the other side, mm-hmm. right? Whereas I'm kind of like, everything we know suggests that everything's just crushed on each on on itself in there. Like, why do we we want to think that it's a whole other universe and it's mind blowing and cool, but it's probably just squished matter. Like, maybe we don't know how it works or how it's supposed to work, but maybe it's just squished matter, right? I feel a lot of times that way about aliens and other things in this universe. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that you're not puppying right now? This might be like the first documented moment in history where Josh was not the puppy. What do you mean? Well, usually you're all like... Yeah, usually you're like, everything is special and awesome! (laughs) And hmm. now well, you're just like, everything is crushed matter. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, though. <laughs> well, okay, so that that's a fun thing to think about, and I appreciate that thought experiment, where perhaps black holes are a whole other universe, and the, universe, and the whole cosmos is just full of gateways to, like, Lord knows what universes, and that's very fun. That's why I love Rick and Morty, right? Because it's a full world of all those, like, science fiction ideas where there's multiple universe theory and all that stuff and there's different timelines and that's very very fun i enjoy that but what i'm really getting at is that i think earth itself is more special than we think like we 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 we, we're reluctant as humans to think about us being the only special ones because we've we messed up (laughs) and we thought about that in the past right i don't know about that i know a lot of people that think they're pretty damn special (laughs) (laughs) Well, what I mean is, like, like science especially is, is reluctant to think that because, again, like, the church really believed that for the longest time and they sort of, like, burned and, and imprisoned, you know, like, scientists for thinking, for saying that we weren't special. Okay. Right. Right. Um, because they would say the sun's not the center of the universe. Yeah. Or, or the sun is the center of the universe rather than Earth. Right. And they would get burned for that. And, and like, Galileo was imprisoned for, for years uh, right. because of that. Because, because he said this, the Earth was not the center of the universe, right? So science today is reluctant to uh, consider that we're n- with, that we are special, right? So when we look at the probability, looking out at all the stars, we think there has to be intelligent life out there. Whereas I, I you know, I I, I, I want to think that I, I think that they're onto something. I think that's probably probable. But I think that there's more to Earth that makes it unique than we may have noticed for example our magnetic field um you may be able to find a planet that is in the goldilocks zone right that Mm -hmm. zone of hot and cold that makes it able to have liquid water and and make life carbon-based life as we know it right but do they have a magnetic field do they have something to protect that planet from radiation just poisoning anything that gets larger than bacteria right Right, but like what if what if life on another planet, they had immunity to radiation, you know, because that life, you know, just because there's alien life doesn't mean it has to exist exactly as we exist. Well, their bodies may be composed differently, you know, like it's absolutely that's, that's true. But like radiation in the truest sense really just kind of like bombards molecules and messes them up. So no matter like what your life form is, radiation in theory will mess with you. Because like it, it, it strips atoms, or it strips electrons off of stuff. So that's like why you have like weird mutations, you know. Hmm. So like even if, I, I mean, I guess there is a way to. I'm trying not to go back to my usual argument of, well, life as we know it, like, but da da da. Right, right, right. Like, right. you know, but that's where I always kind of find myself going to is like, yeah. I don't hmm. want to be. You know, when I think of all these different things, I'm aware that we we pull so much from what we know and what our experiences are. But there are other experiences and there are other, you know, there's so much that we just don't know or have an experience and have no way to experience, like taking a step out. And it is certainly possible. I mean, there are elements that no matter what, 
Um, they resist like radiation poisoning. Like, like that's why we put lead all around stuff because it's a stable element. So you can blast all the radiation you want at lead, and it's not going to go through it. It's it's lead. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't react to to, right. to electrons stripping it. So I mean, there could be a life form that somehow has developed a way to resist radiation. That's totally possible. Yeah, like the way we have we have we do have metals in our bodies. You know, we do, for instance, absorb lead. You know, what if there's another kind of life out there that is has, has a higher lead skin. Yeah, hey, you never like you don't you don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you that know? is possible. Sure, sure. But then again, like um, I think about like our tides that we have, our moon. You mm-hmm. know, are there other? So you have a Goldilocks planet. Does it have a magnetic field to protect from radiation? Does it have a moon? Does it have tides? Because we don't we don't we sort of assume that life will exist. What, however. But how influential were, were the tides on life developing on land? Like, if you have a stable ocean and a stable land, there's no reason that life would ever, like, crawl out of that unless it has those tides, that that that, that the magic zone along the shore to go from being a, a, a sea creature to a land creature. Right. You know, because that's really where all of those, uh, all of those, like, evolutionary... Um, uh, uh, advances would have happened in that Goldilocks zone on the shore, too. Does that planet have tides? You know? And well, I mean, again, you're assuming that that other alien life evolved the way we evolved. Sure. So, I guess I guess, kind of my thought is if intelligent alien life exists, it's an even smaller likelihood that they're similar to us in a way that we could even communicate or even fathom. Oh yeah, them. like there could be alien life yeah. out there that we just don't there's no way for us to to communicate. We just maybe we just don't understand each other. Maybe they don't speak with, you know, maybe they don't have a mouth, yeah, you know. And, and maybe there's it's, maybe there are even uh species on this very planet that are as intelligent and as us. And I have, have no way thought of to, that, you know, like what if there's I mean a whale an, animals out there. Oh yeah. I mean yeah. a whale has has a brain the size of a bus. Dolphins like, click, you yeah. know, and they understand a lot, you know. Um they're able to do so much. You, you know, they can do math, you know, they can answer questions, you know, if you if you train them to speak you know, in a way that they can are capable of, yeah. you know, they don't have lips, so they can't speak our language. But, you know, and I, I've definitely thought of that. So I've taken what I've, you know, kind of contemplated about language here. And, you know, there, it could be the same thing with alien life, you know. So, yeah, well, you, I, you know, there's another really great episode of uh, Cosmos and I always sort of like fall back on Cosmos when I talk about science um, because I'm not an expert, but I am a, a, a pop scientist, you know, whore. <laughs> um, pop sci- I'm a pop science whore. Um, so there's one really fantastic uh, episode where he talks about whales and how like just different types of communication alien. And he's talking about this very sort of uh, sort of subject. And he talks about how whales um, in terms of information conveyed like the simplest way you can convey information is binary code which is what we use for computing yes mm-hmm. or no off or on right zero or one mm-hmm. binary code if you compute if, if you really like plug whale um song into a computer the amount of information the amount of bits zeros and ones that they can communicate is astronomical compared to our own language so they could be far beyond what we're even where we're even at yet we think we're so special because we can build shelves and books and you know smartphones yeah yeah the the emotional capability of an orca for example is just completely they are so emotionally developed and we don't even most people don't even realize or know that you Mm -hmm. know um it, it is just really fascinating to to think you know we we know what we know and this is why i always come back to this we know what we know we know what we understand Mm -hmm. but there is still you know when you think about what we know versus what is out there it's such an infinitesimally small percentage yeah yeah. and it's maddening because you know when you look back even when you look back on the historic historical march of science it's like people were on the threshold of so many things that are now so obvious to us. Right. You know? Yeah. And and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like, what do we not know <laughs> about tomorrow? Uh, for example, uh, Tycho Brahe, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was the guy. He, he spent his whole, ye- whole life observing the stars, right? And he made amazingly accurate uh, 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 observations of all the stars, but he couldn't get his model of the universe to work. He could never, I mean, he died, like, 
frustrated and angry about ne never getting it all to fit together because mm. he, he just refused to believe that the Earth could rot could orbit the Sun, I oh. guess, or something like that. So he he just he he died never having any idea, you know. But again, like he couldn't fathom the things that we know now, you know. So all of the things that we'll one day know about the universe, like and all these these ways to communicate with dolphins or whales or 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 uh, you know like other life forms, these are all things that we. You can't think about them until they're already discovered. That's so weird. It's like this, this... And you and you really can't discover... I feel like you can't discover new things until your mind is free. Like, until you let go of what you think you know, you can't... You know, you may not discover what the truth. Mm, you have you know? to accept that you don't know everything, or... Yeah, I mean, his his ultimate failure was not being able to accept the idea that the Earth was orbiting something else. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was so stuck on what he thought he knew, it stopped him from, you know, he, he maybe possibly could have been the one to figure that out and solve that puzzle, you know? Yeah. So it's it's just fascinating. Yeah. So we look at, like, aliens, and, and well, what what it comes back to it is, do you believe it is out there? You know? Yeah, and I believe that it's completely possible that mm. they know that we're here. So not only do you believe that aliens probably exist, they do exist, or they are they have already made contact, or they're already active among humans? Not necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's possible that if there's life out there, it could be possible that they're more advanced than us. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, again, this is a very if, if, if. If that is the case, and they've you know possibly made it, to where we are, you know, if I was an alien, I, I would not, I would not talk to us. <laughs> I think you shared this before, but I, we, I had to edit it out because it was off topic. Yeah, but now it's not. All so right. I'm going to talk about it. All right. Talk about it, girl. So <laughs> I think that if aliens have ever discovered us, they would take a look at us and turn around and leave and probably post like an intergalactic warning around our planet that says... Hey, these guys aren't ready to deal with us. Leave them alone, or you'll die. Potentially, um, I, don't I don't know. I, I don't know. I think I think aliens would unite us because we'd suddenly like we wouldn't be like, oh, they're Russian. Oh, we're American. Oh, oh, they'd unify us. Yeah. Against them. Well, they, they like yes and no. My thought here is that aliens would come by and see how we can't even handle peace with each other. Okay. And. If we can't handle peace with each other, there's no way in hell we're going to be able to handle peace with them. <laughs> you know? Well, I don't know. I think that's a like, kind of an oversimple way to look at it. But I think that, like, if, if suddenly aliens existed, then all of a sudden we would realize how silly it is that we care that if we're Russian or American or whatever. You know, we suddenly care whether, whether we're black or white. Well, what is that compared to an entire alien species? You know, I think that will unify us. And I think that's no, real. No, I agree. I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. I agree with you, yeah. but <laughs> I still think that aliens would not want to deal with us the way that we exist currently. Hmm. Because we're, in our history, humans have displayed a pattern of uh, xenophobia. Hmm. Well, I think that's evolutionary, first of all. Yeah, but, like, over and over again, we unite against what is different or unknown. And if aliens studied us, they would see that pattern, and they would know that, in this case, they are the xenophobic trigger. Right, but if they're intelligent, then they'll, they'll know to meet us on a level of familiarity. If, so, they, if they meet with us in a diplomatic manner, as though they are another nation, or something like that. Okay, but here's... Okay, so there's an episode of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Your face. <laughs> there's an episode it's of my, Star it's Trek. It's my turn to make faces now. Next Generation. All right, tell me about Star Trek. When um, I think I need Starship another, Enterprise. I think I need another whiskey for this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Starship Enterprise is sent to make first contact with a planet, and uh, Riker which is one of the officers on the ship, he goes down uh, dressed as... He, he's in the disguise of one of these alien people because mm -hmm. he's going to, like, get to get to kind of know them and then, 
you know, they're going to make first contact and everything. Um, but he gets injured and then, you know, things happen and they end up revealing themselves to the leader of the planet and this other guy in charge kind of freaks out about there being aliens and goes kind of crazy. Understandably. Yeah. And the president is like, you know, our planet is not ready to deal with this. You know, there's, you know, mass panic about the even even the idea of this being a thing and they end up kind of like leaving and determining that it's not the right time and when I watched that episode I was like this is exactly how I feel earth would be and I, I think maybe whoever wrote that episode also had the same that idea the same theory yeah and that's hmm. why that's that I feel like that's why they wrote it um hmm. no you know because some like society is not always ready to deal with a given a given topic so i think it would change everything i, I really I, I think it would if suddenly you know somebody said hey by the way aliens exist right but i think and again this may be naive and a lot of people will probably call this naive but i think by and large humanity can handle it we've been through a lot of stuff and like we are engineered to prevail and figure it out so I think that, re- like, we always look at humanity as, like, dumb, panicky, like, children, animals. But I really think we'll do better than we think. If suddenly, like, if tomorrow the announcement comes out, aliens exist, by the way. They've made contact with President whatever. They've, made con- they've chosen to make contact with President Obama. And Obama and the United States is in, you know, diplomatic relations with these aliens. We're talking about this, that, whatever. You know, that's different than a sudden invasion. That's a different than a sudden scary pop-up. You know, if they meet us on that level... If they meet us on the level that we know diplomatically as a foreign nation, as the foreign, as the ultimate foreign nation, the foreign planet, Mm. you know, if they are intelligent enough to meet us on that level because they've recognized those patterns of xenophobia in humanity, you know. So, I mean, it 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 boils down to a certain degree of uh, competition for survival, which takes another that's another layer is uh, intergalactic resources. You know, so I, I why mean, are they making contact with us to take our resources? No, 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 no. Or... Like, so resources come in as another factor, um, because another trait of humanity, and I imagine any kind of life. You know, there's a survival component, but again, a very common com- conflict that we see on Earth is, I want your oil. Give me, give me that. And, and military advances to obtain such things. So if aliens look at that and think, okay, well, they're fighting with each other for these resources, what's to stop them from realizing we have something that they want and then they're going to come after us? You know, it's, it's another layer to it, hmm. you know? Well, I mean, if we were advanced enough to do that, but I think if an alien species reached us right now, there would be no. Threat oh, they'd to that. be they'd be advanced for now, right? But, but like, you can bet Earth would make it its first mission to get on that level. Earth, sure. w- Earth would but like they... like Independence Day. It would be very much a <laughs> we need to defend ourselves. Like we need to have this technology so that we can, you know, nobody wants to be the third world country. <laughs> sure, but, but the the reality is we would be. So, you know, no one's af- afraid that, you know, uh, Bangladesh is suddenly going to invade us. You know what I mean? Even if Bangladesh does want our resources, no one's no one's expecting them to make a conquering campaign of the United States. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with being Bangladeshi. Um, but... <sighs> Sorry, Mo. <laughs> but, but, like, they are our guides. They are our teachers if they come to us. And we are, we can't, we can, we can't even get to Mars right now. There's no way we can invade another planet. There's no way. Someday, perhaps. But in that meantime, they have chosen to make contact with us. They are our guides. Mm-hmm. You know, they are the powers that be, and there's no way we can possibly contest them. You know, so there was no real, there was no authentic fear of us as humanity, like wiping out others, other species at this point, because we're just not advanced enough. There's no way. So if they do know we exist, they can sit back and wait until we become advanced enough or they can approach us now as the all-knowing, amazing gurus of, of, of technology. I don't know. I would... 
if I was an alien, I'd still wait it out. Because just think of Earth was broken up into so many smaller clans. Sure. Like over time, we only become more and more unified. True. You know, we've seen, you know, clans, you know, bands of roaming people turn into tribes. I, I would tribes say tribes. turn into towns, yeah. you know, towns turn into cities, cities turn into nations, mm-hmm. countries, you know. Um, and as as time goes on, it only becomes more unified. I would wait for things to get even better before. I, again, it's all, I'm very pattern oriented. Mm-hmm. And I feel like. I don't know, pattern recognition is probably the way to go when you're trying to deal with anything you don't know about, but that's just, yeah. I don't mean, that's me. Again, I'm working yeah. off of what I know. Yeah, so. this is so funny, too, because thinking about stuff like this just makes me, like, think about what blubbering apes we must be to any sort of higher, you know, intelligent life. Like, I always take, like, there's a really great speech where um, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about how, like, chimpanzees are, like, 97% genetically uh, identical to us. Think about that 3%. And us trying to communicate with chimpanzees. Yeah. You know, and then think about 3% the other way. Like something that's 3% more advanced than us. And we're all just like, like, oh, yeah, it's like <laughs> trying oh, to talk about science. Look at those humans, like, flapping their mouth holes at each other. <laughs> right. Like, trying to describe what they're saying. <laughs> like. Exactly. You know, if I could, if, if, if within that 3% of advancement, if that's the difference between <clears throat> us trying to articulate our thoughts and being able to beam thoughts into each other's brain for instant <laughs> understanding. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, we're the we're the gorillas of the, you know, <laughs> totally Yeah, and and uh, and if an alien even came to to visit us right now, they would be like the Jane Goodall of our planet and we'd be there like, "What is this? <laughs> what is this thing? I don't even know." Yeah, just dressed, you know, con- concealed to look like us, and we we're just like, okay, <laughs> can't tell the difference, you know, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's plainly obvious to them. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Dude, so fun to think about. Maybe I'm an alien. Yeah, but what conclusion? Maybe I'm trying to like reach oh. out to you. Mm, well, I, I hope I didn't uh, destroy you, destroy your alien, uh, <laughs> your, your higher alien morals with whiskey. <laughs> whiskey is universal. Universally gone. I like that. <laughs> oh, is that what that was? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to explain my thoughts to you. <laughs> Clean. You're trying to beam thoughts into my brain. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what conclusion have we reached? We, we went off on some some serious tangents this season. Yeah, but it, uh, this is a good. This is and, good. Yeah, this I, one, this, yeah um, I enjoyed this one. Um, so does life exist outside of our planet? Probably. But if it's beyond it does, our understanding. it's... First of all, it's beyond obviously beyond our our current level of understanding, and mm. probably very different than what we know or can even fathom. Yeah, you know, I mean, think of like stuff like the mantis shrimp, which sees and like <gasps> beyond mantis shrimp. <laughs> you just said one of my favorite things. <laughs> Buzzword. It, but but it's it's so funny because that I mean that creature sees in colors we cannot comprehend. It sees in like all spectrums of light and like it makes like sonic boons with its claws and like we we can't even begin to fathom like why it sees the way it does or like why it like what the purpose of its eyes even it's are. It's amazing. It's like, a oh, guys look like, up that's, mantis that's, shrimp right now. And that's on our own planet. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's an entirely different evolutionary timeline. Well, I, I know that I keep coming back to, to Star Trek, but watching Star Trek has really pushed my mind as far as the universe and potential other life in the universe goes. Like, there are all these different amazing, you know, theatrical representations of some of the ideas that we have talked about today. Mm, I bet you and it's crea- really cool. I bet you the creators of Star Trek watched Cosmos. Probably. <laughs> I mean, science. <laughs> when in doubt, just go science. <laughs> yeah, it's science. And then drink your whiskey. <laughs> so, so the conclusion we reached is yes, probably life exists. I mean, almost definitely life exists outside of our planet. I mean, I'm convinced it's more complex than, than just math. I'm convinced there is more to Earth than we think. For it's a time. kind of like saying, you know, oh, lightning only strikes the same spot once, or, you know, oh, it's a one in a million chance of X. You know, it's like just because the odds are small doesn't 
mean that it's impossible. Right. And it just on, means that it's unlikely. Right. And in the mathematical scale of the universe, it it's so massive it's that so that chance massive. happens billions and billions and billions of times. So it's inevitable that it will happen again. Yeah. Lightning will strike the same but place twice because the plane is infinite. But it's also entirely possible that that lightning will strike twice, but we're on one side of something and maybe it struck somewhere else, but it is just that far away yeah you know it could we in, may never meet I mean, you in, know like it, our earth may collapse and be gone before whatever life makes it out here and theirs could be gone too you know you just don't know there's no way to yeah. know right now maybe one day we'll be able to, to i don't know and, i'm, and I'm, I'm just intrigued to yeah, see I mean, where I mean, things go and, and it's maddening right and this goes back to our immortality question you know how un- how unfortunate. I was gonna say that, yeah. And how unfortunate it is that we'll never probably see that, you know. Um, but that's you know that's a lot we're given, I suppose. Yeah, and, and you know what else is fascinating too? Uh, well, I mean that's. A whole I love how discussion. we keep trying to wrap up, but then we come up with another point. We just can't stop. Yeah, we, yeah. we can't stop. We can't stop because we won't stop. So, in conclusion, um, <laughs> if life exists outside of Earth. It's probably beyond anything we've ever fathomed, and there's probably no chance we'll ever talk to it. So, yep. enjoy the life you're given, I suppose. If you guys want to meet aliens, take better care of the planet. Yeah, that. This got real. That is definitely... <laughs> well, all of us need to take better better care of the planet. That's why I don't have a car. No, That's not why, you <laughs> no, dirty, sure filthy liar. Sure it is. It's because I'm, I love the planet. <laughs> I love the planet, and you don't, because you drive everywhere. Wow. Thanks, guys. Um, this was Whiskey Talk. I'm Josh. It most certainly was. And this is Christine. <laughs> and uh, thanks for listening, guys. Have a great night. And for all you aliens out there. <laughs> <laughs>